Leviticus 22, verse 32. You shall not profane my holy name, but I will be sanctified among the sons of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who brought you out from the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we confess with the psalmist that the law of the Lord is is perfect, converting the soul. And that the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. And so, Father, as we hear your law and your precepts, we pray for hearts to rejoice and for souls to be converted and that Jesus would be honored. And we ask it in his name. Amen. The great theologian Margaret Thatcher once said, Being a leader is like being a woman. If you have to tell people you are one, then you aren't one. (laughs) Within the nation of Israel, there was absolutely zero question about who its spiritual leaders were. It was quite obvious to everyone and quite clear to everyone. Their presence among the people was the center of their worship and their identity. And everyone knew that the priests were special spiritual leaders. They came from a special family. They wore special clothes. They served and worked at a special place. They ate special food. They followed special rules, and they enjoyed many special privileges of being in that position. But as we all know, with great privilege comes what? Great responsibility. And that is especially true for those who are in leadership. And that's what our passage is about this morning. Now, if you've been here in this study, you know that we've been saying that the the main theme, that the book of Leviticus is about holiness. That God has brought His people out of pagan Egypt, and He's about to take them into pagan Canaan. And He does not want His people to be pagan at all. Don't copy the Egyptians before you, and don't copy the Canaanites in front of you. Be sure that you, as my people, are distinct that you're different, that you stand out. They were to be clean and moral and set apart. Now, I want to be clear, as I always try to be at the beginning of this. When when you look at the book of Leviticus, we must be clear about something. Israel, in, in keeping the book of Leviticus, they're not trying to appease God as much as they are trying to represent God. They're not keeping these rules in order to be saved. They're keeping these rules because they have been saved. They were already brought out of Egypt. They had already experienced the Day of Atonement. Blood has been shed. Forgiveness has been given. And so this section of Leviticus is called the Holiness Code because the question is, how do we live in light of the blood? How do we live in light of forgiveness? How do we live on this side of the atonement? And so God wants His people to be holy people. But of course, people seldom rise above the spiritual level of their leaders. And that's why Leviticus 21 and 22 is so important, because God gives the leaders, the priests of Israel, some clear instructions about how they can be good examples to the rest of the nation. How they can help the rest of the families of the community to follow in God's path. And so we learn in this chap- these chapters here that God's people need holy leaders, which is why they are held to a higher standard. God's people need holy leaders, which is why they are held to a higher standard. Now, the passage in front of us is a little bit tricky. And the reason it's tricky is because we don't have a priesthood anymore. In fact, just to be sure, to be careful, I did this in the early service. If there are any Levitical priests here this morning, would you raise your hand? Anybody? Anybody? No, I didn't think so. 
So there's a challenge in trying to take this passage that was meant for an audience that no longer exists. What, what do we do with this today? Well, I think in one sense that, that all of us, whether we realize it or not, we are in fact, as God's children, we are called a royal priesthood in 1 Peter 2. And, and all of us, probably in some form or fashion, we are leaders ourselves. You, you may not think of yourself that way, but you've heard it said before, the simplest definition of a leader is anyone who has followers. You're either a leader or you're being chased, but that's a whole nother sermon, I guess, for a whole nother Sunday. But think about it for a second. Is there anybody who looks up to you? Nieces? Nephews? Grandchildren? The company intern? Kids in the neighborhood? Co-workers? Younger men and women who ask you advice? I think all of us, in some sense, are, in fact, leaders. And we need to listen to this message. But to narrow it down a little bit more, and, and to be a bit more specific, the priests were not just generic leaders. They were spiritual leaders. They were most notably the leaders of Israel's worship. And so we have to ask, do we have that today? The answer, of course, is yes. God has given His people today. He's given to, 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 to us today spiritual leaders in the church. We talked about this Wednesday night, actually. We're talking about our doctrinal statement, and there are two offices in the local church, the office of pastor or elder and the office of deacon. And these two groups are now entrusted with the task of being leaders and, and, and those who guide and help the church. Now, when we hear that, some of you I know you're going to mentally check out on me and say, well, I'm not an elder, I'm not a deacon, and pretty good chance I'm never going to be one. I'm not planning on being one that's not my pursuit. Well, I want you to listen closely because I want to remind you that as a church, as a congregation, we are right now in the process of searching for new elders. That is one of the sacred tasks that God has given to a local congregation is to select its own leaders, to put names forward, to put men forward, to examine them and to consider them to serve in that way. And that is not a task that is simply done by a few people. It is the charge given to the entire congregation. In fact, if I could say it this way, one of the worst things that we Baptists often do is when there's a leadership vacancy, we just put the first warm body in that volunteers. Our main criteria is, does he have a pulse? <laughs> All right, good, let him do it, you know. No, 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 God, God, God has an expectation for those who are in leadership, and none of us should take that lightly. We should all take seriously and to be praying and to be, be doing our part to make sure that as a church we are looking for the right kind of individuals to be spiritual leaders among the household of God. And as we see in this chapter that, that, that God's people need holy leaders, which is why they're held to a higher standard. And in these two chapters we see two of those standards, two of those higher standards that they are held to that we want to consider this morning. So whether this is your future in ministry, whether this is maybe you're currently serving in that way in our church, or maybe just as part of a church, you see and know the significance of this. There's something for all of us to learn. So let me summarize the two chapters and then we'll, we'll dive right in. In the first chapter, Leviticus 21, here we learn that those who lead God's people are held to a higher standard personally. Those who lead God's people are held to a higher standard personally. Now, if you read chapter 21 this week, and by the way, I hope some of you did. If you've not been doing that, let me encourage you. It's not too late. Pick up this next week, get the bulletin, go online, find the sermon text and read along. You'll get the most out of it. But if you did read this week, you know that in verse 21, it's all about individual qualifications for priests. How a man could be a priest and how he could remain a priest. And this chapter is going to talk about issues of family, issues of marriage, and even some of their personal physical characteristics. But in all of this, we see that the priests are being held to a higher standard personally. Notice where the chapter begins, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them. Now just pause right there for a moment. 
Notice God is addressing this code of conduct directly to the priests. They need to know what God expects of them. They need to abide by it. And they need to be clear on what they can and cannot do. Now, what's fascinating to me about this, these two chapters, if you remember way back in Leviticus in chapters 8, 9, and 10, we saw a section on priests already. The difference between that section and this section is so much of what was in 8, 9, and 10 was what the priest did at the tabernacle. So they would spend time, you got to wear these clothes, you got to take this bath, you got to give this sacrifice, you got to do this and do that. And all of that was about their job. Here in chapter 21 and 22, so much of what it talks about are things that they would do away from the tabernacle. He's not talking about their actual occupation until the very end. He sort of mentions it. But most of what he's talking about is God is looking at them when they've clocked off, when they've clocked out of duty, when they've left the, 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 the worship, when they've gone home, when they're in the community, God is still looking at them and wanting them to be qualified. And so in this chapter here, we find there are kind of two parts. There's the first part, which is 1 through 15, and then the second part. Note, notice this first part. It mainly is talking about funerals and weddings. Now, when you think of pastors and clergymen, we often say they marry people and bury people. That's that's part of what we do. And that's sort of what this chapter, this section is about in verses 1 through 15. He begins by talking about what funerals priests were allowed to attend. Look at verse 1 where we left off. No one shall defile himself for a dead person among his people, except for his relatives who are nearest to him his mother and his father and his son and his daughter and his brother and also for his virgin sister. So he says there are only certain funerals he can go to. This is the, the priestly, you know, the, 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 the bereavement policy of the tabernacle. Y- y- your job is not in jeopardy. You can have the time off. You can go to these certain funerals. But notice it's not a whole lot of people. It is only the members of his immediate family. And why is this? Verse 4, He shall not defile himself as a relative by marriage among his people and so profane himself. As we've already said many times, that a dead body would have made a priest unclean. Now that's not hygiene. That's not about germs. In the Old Testament sense, Death, of course, was the result of sin. Death was the result of the curse, of the fall of man. And so what is it? He's reminding them that priests were to, to, to not carry within themselves emblems and symbols of, of fallenness, of, of brokenness, and of their sin. And the priests were to be good examples before the people, and in that sense they were to be ambassadors of the covenant of life. They were not to be involved in matters of death. They could attend certain funerals, but notice verse 5, they shall not make any baldness on their heads, nor shall they shave off the edges of their beards, nor make any cuts in their flesh. They weren't allowed to mourn as many of them did. Some of them were pagan traditions, some were probably Jewish traditions, but either way, even though they could go to the funeral, they couldn't cry like everybody else. They couldn't mourn like everybody else. Because why? They were ambassadors of the covenant of life. And they were not to be overwhelmed by death. They were to give a a sense of of those issues. So those are some of the protocol for the priests. Now, there's a in this section, he's going to single out one person among them, and that is the high priest. Look at verse 10. The priest who is the highest among his brothers. So that's the high priest. He cannot uncover his head nor tear his clothes. Look at verse 11. Nor shall he approach any dead person nor defile himself even for his father or his mother. So while the priest could go to certain family members' funerals, the high priest could go to no one's. He could not attend a funeral, not even for his own parents. Now that seems harsh to us, but God wanted them to realize that the high priest was a respected position and, and they wanted them, God wanted them to know the significance of what it is to be a pure, life-giving representative of God on earth. And he didn't want any confusion. So those are the sort of funeral qualifications. There's also in this section here a bit of marriage qualifications. 
If you go back a little bit to verse 7, he says, They shall not take a woman who is profaned by harlotry, nor shall they take a woman divorced from her husband, for he is holy to his God. So a priest could marry a woman, but she could not be divorced, and she could not be a prostitute. If you skip down to verse 13, he talks about the high priest, and notice what it says there. He shall take a wife in her virginity. A widow or a divorced woman or one who is profaned by harlotry, these he may not take. So the priest could pick a wife, but she couldn't be a prostitute or a divorcee. She could be a widow. The high priest couldn't even marry a widow. She had to be a virgin. And in that sense, God wanted the marriages of his spiritual leaders to be free from corruption and sin and, 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 and um, uh, a compromise. He wanted there to be cleanness. He wanted their marriages and families to serve as an example to everyone else in Israel. So in this section here, it's about these funerals and marriages. By the way, I know this is maybe not an exact correlation, but I think it's worth noting here, you can learn a lot about a pastor today by listening to how he conducts funerals and weddings. I don't know if you've ever been to funerals where instead of preaching the gospel, the guy decides to talk the person into heaven. It never works. And and, and weddings, if they're only designed as, oh, it's gushy, go love and so forth, and they never get to the fact that love, that marriage is a picture of Christ and the church, they've missed the point. And so there is a sense in which in a sense, that that even funerals and marriages and how they're overseen today, really, it, it still should be a good example to the rest of God's people. Not only that, but they had other qualifications. There were physical qualifications that they had to do, and that's the last half of this chapter. When I was in high school, I remember when I was a freshman, they told us that in order to play sports at school, you had to pass a physical. Well, I didn't know what a physical was, so I asked a buddy, I said, what is a physical? He said, you have to strip down your underwear and go in the locker room, and some doctor is going to go in there and check you. And I remember thinking, well, there goes my sports career. I'm going to quit now, you know. I did not want to do part. Well, I finally got the courage up to, 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 to do it. But, but why do they do that? Well, because you don't want somebody with a chronic medical condition. It would be unsafe. They had to be cleared physically. Well, the Old Testament priests, they had to also be cleared physically. They had to be free from physical deformities and injuries and handicaps. They had to be physically whole. Notice verse 17. Speak to Aaron, saying, No man of your offspring throughout their generations who has a defect shall approach to offer the food of his God. So here he says, You cannot serve in this way as a priest if you have a defect. Well, that raises the question, What qualifies as a defect? You know, I got a birthmark, I got a mole, I got a this, I got a that, what... What, what, what makes me, what, what's a defect? Well, that's what he lists in 18. For no one who has a defect shall approach. Notice the list. A blind man, or a lame man, or he who has a disfigured face, or any deformed limb, or a man who has a broken foot, or a broken hand, or a hunchback, or a dwarf, or one who has a defect in his eye, or eczema, or scab, scabs, or crushed testicles. I was talking about this list with my oldest son, and he said, how do they know if you had that last thing? I said, somebody had to check. He said, I don't want to do that job. And I said, all right, well, we don't, we don't do this anymore. Being a priest was not always glamorous, I guess. But he, he goes through these 12 physical features that they had to be examined for. And again, it's not that having one of these made, made a person have less dignity. It doesn't mean that the person was not, uh, 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 that, that there was something wrong with them in the sense of sin. There, there was a sense in which, though, the priest was to be what? Physically whole. Physically complete. Remember, Israel was supposed to recapture a little bit of the Garden of Eden. And in the Garden of Eden, everything was good and right and perfect and everything was clean and and nothing was deformed because God said it was all very, very good. And so in the tabernacle, they were supposed to have a little bit of that real estate. And so God says, you're not to have a person with any of these sort of chronic medical conditions serve in this way. 
They were to represent God to the people, and they were to represent the people before God, and they needed to be specimens of health and strength and life, because our God is a God of health and strength and life. And so he says there, if any of those men serve, that they will profane the sanctuaries. God's sanctuary was was pure and clean. And for any one of these people who are broken or deformed in any way, if they came in, then the holy sanctuary would be unholy, and that was unacceptable. So what is this entire chapter about? Be it the funeral qualifications or the marriage qualifications or the physical qualifications, again, the point here is that each priest had to be individually qualified. And they were held to a higher standard personally. Now, what do we do with this today? Well, those who are pursuing Christian leadership today are still held to a higher standard. Of course, church leaders today, the central issue is not physical qualifications, but moral and spiritual qualifications. I was reading this week a story about the Smithsonian. I did not know this, that the Smithsonian has 156 million items. And the curator in the article was saying that only 2% of their collection is ever on display. And that most of what they have is never put in a glass case. Most of it's never actually put out. It's on sto- in storage to be preserved or even at times to be studied. And and in the article they ask, how do you decide what goes out and how do you decide what stays in storage? And the curator said, just because an item is valuable doesn't mean it is museum worthy. Some items, he says, they look ordinary. In fact, some of the items might be quite modest and quite plain. But they are museum worthy if it's something worth looking at and something worth learning from. I think there is something that can be said about those who would be in leadership today within the church. Not every item in the Smithsonian is museum worthy, and not everyone who graduates seminary is leadership worthy. Paul tells us that a good, it is a good thing if a man desires to be a church leader, but just because a man desires it doesn't mean that he deserves it. That's why Paul gives the list of qualifications for elders and for deacons. Now, I don't think that the parallels are exact here, but it's interesting when you pick up the New Testament qualifications how Paul talks about a lot of these same issues. Their marriage has to be a certain way. Their family has to be a certain way. Their reputation has to be a certain way. Their character has to be a certain way. Those who serve in leadership in the church need to be, quote, above reproach. They need to be blameless and good examples before the flock of God. New Testament churches and healthy churches must look for healthy leaders and not just put anyone in leadership. There's an old African proverb that says, Character is like pregnancy. You can't hide it forever. At some point, sooner or later, a man's character or his lack of character will become obvious. It will show itself. And that's why the church must be very diligent and very careful to to, to look for those to serve the church and to be before the church that are a good example. In fact, I would venture to say there are some of you in this church that you in the past, you have been in churches where there was a moral failure by a pastor or a spiritual leader and that experience still haunts you. I never forget in a new members class one time talking to an older older couple and they, they had said, they kind of sheepishly said they had been out of church for almost 10 years. They had a solid testimony. They seemed godly. And I said, why have you been out of church for 10 years? And at the last church they were at, the pastor had an affair with the secretary. And they said, we know that that, that we shouldn't uh, put too much confidence in him. We shouldn't let that keep us away from church. That's why we're back now. But they said, you know, it was devastating because of that experience. There is no quicker way to ruin a church than to put someone in leadership that doesn't have the necessary character 
to be in that position. This is why I need you to pray for me and I need you to pray for our elders. I'm not involved in any moral failures and I don't plan to, but I don't think David woke up planning to do it either. After a moment of temptation and weakness, he ruined his family and really ruined the kingdom. This is one thing I think as a church we should praise God for and continually pray for, which is the integrity of our church elders. We're looking for new elders. We need to pray about that. We need to pray for our search committee and pray for the discussions and pray for the process and pray for all that is involved. Mark my words, the only thing worse than having no elders is having the wrong elders. And that's why those who lead God's church must be held to a higher level standard personally by the way if you're here and you're going into ministry and we have seminary students i know we have many in our church listen to me closely you have a potential a great potential to do good and an even greater potential to do harm be careful that's why paul told timothy pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching the order of those is not accidental Before you pay attention to your teaching, you need to pay attention to yourself. We so often tell young men in seminary, you need to, you need to, you need to know Calvin and you need to know Augustine and you need to know Luther and all that's true, but they also need to know themselves and commit themselves before the Lord. Proper creeds will not make up for an improper character. While the church is looking for qualified men, we all understand that we are not looking for perfect men. The best of men are still only men at best, right? And the reason we're not looking for perfect men is because there is only one perfect man, and he is Christ. Don't put your eternal confidence in church shepherds. Put your eternal confidence in the good shepherd. And He stands as the center of our faith. And He stands at the center of our worship. In fact, what I find fascinating about, as you look at this chapter in light of Christ, is that in His crucifixion and in His floggings and in His beatings, Christ would have been disqualified to be a priest. He would have been disfigured and He would have been scarred. And yet the Father was pleased to take Him who did not meet these standards and to qualify him because of his character, because of his life, his sinless life, and his substitutionary death on our behalf. And so he becomes not just a priest, not just a high priest, he becomes the great high priest who gave himself once for all. So that's the first standard, personally. Number two, in chapter 22, those who lead God's people are held to a higher standard vocationally. Vocationally. In chapter 21, he talks a lot about qualifications. Now in chapter 22, he's going to go back a little bit to the issue of occupation. These priests not only need character, they also need competency. They need commitment to do their job and to do it well. And they were held to a higher standard. They were to manage the worship of Israel and they were ultimately to, 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 to lead the people of Israel in a diligent fashion. Now, if you notice in chapter 22, look where he starts in verse 2. Tell Aaron and his sons to be careful with the holy gifts. Now, that's what this chapter is about. When the people came to worship, they would bring an animal, they'd bring uh, some grain, they'd bring some kind of gift, some bit of food, and they would bring that to the priest. And he says, tell the priests that in their job, I'm watching them. They need to be diligent, they need to be careful to do the job right and to do it well. If they are unclean or they do something that is unclean, it will affect their job performance. So God tells them in this chapter what to do. In verses all the way through verse 8, he's talking here about that the fact that they should be clean and they should remain clean and that if they, 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 they do become unclean, they need to quickly rectify that and deal with it. 
Now again, what were these gifts? As I just said, they were, they were food. Do you remember way back at the beginning of Leviticus when they brought an offering? Some of the offering was burned and some of the offering was what? It was eaten. Eaten by who? Eaten by the priests. If you look at verse 7, it says, But when the sun sets, he will be clean, and afterwards he shall eat of the holy gifts, for it is his food. God, God built in a, a meal plan into the work of a priest. This is how God cook, took care of them. This is how they had what they needed. But not only that, this food also went to provide for their families. It's also what they brought home, and they would give it to their closest relatives, their wife and their kids, so that they would have something as well. I was going to say this is how they would bring home the bacon, but I don't think that works in a Jewish, <laughs> Jewish uh, con- context here. <clears throat> Notice verse 11, But if a priest buys a slave as his property with his money, that one may eat of it, and those who are born in his house may eat of his food. So his wife and his children and any slaves that had become, in that sense, part of the family, they were allowed to eat at the dinner table. So the priest would come home with a big box after a sweaty day at work, and he'd walk in, and the kids would say, Yay, Dad brought dinner. And they would say, What's for dinner? And Mom would say, Let me guess, it's ribeyes and lamb chops and matzo bread again, right? And he'd say, Why do you say it that way? And she says, Because you bring on the same thing every night. There never is any variety of what you bring. And he says, Woman, what is wrong with you? And she says, Are you starting this again? And I don't know why I did all that, but there was conversations. And they would all eat. The wife and the kids would eat, but not everybody could eat. Look at verse 10. No layman is to eat, no sojourner or a hired man. If you've got a plumber at your house, you can't invite him in to eat, not this food. Verse 12, if his daughter gets married, she can no longer eat. If she gets divorced or she becomes a widow, then she can come back and eat. Verse 13. So there was a sense in which this food was only for the priest and for his immediate family. Now again, let me point out to you, why why am I pointing all this out? Why is this significant? Because can you imagine how easy it would have been to cut corners with this? How easy it would have been to slouch on this? I mean, this is is stuff that happens off the clock. You're not at the tabernacle. Nobody's watching. You're behind closed doors. You're around your dinner table. There was lots of food, probably plenty of food for plenty of people to, to invite the neighborhood kids and anybody else and, and just to, you know, your aunt and uncle, anybody, everybody can join and eat. And you think that might be what they would do. But the priestly food was only to be eaten by the priest and his family. Which means what? The priests were responsible to guard it, to distribute it correctly. Even when they were off the clock, God was watching. Even they were at home, God was watching. Even when they were with their family around the dinner table, God was watching. And they were held to a higher standard. It's just food. Yeah, but God says this is special food. And it only can be eaten by certain people. And the priest was supposed to guard that. I remember years ago having a coach who taught me more than sports. He taught me a definition that has stuck with me my entire life. I was in about seventh grade, and he taught us as a group. He says, boys, he said, integrity is doing what's right when nobody's looking. It's doing what's right when nobody else is looking. That's what God expected here of these priests. Who knows if they gave the food to other people? Who's going to kind of spy through their window? Who's going to know this? God's going to know this. And they're going to know this. And it was a matter of integrity to do what was right when nobody else was looking. And so they had to be diligent in their vocation in handling the food. In verses 17 to the end, there's a reminder about their job with the sacrifices themselves. Look, if you will, just look at verse 20. He says, Whatever animal has a defect... You shall not offer, for it will be accepted, excuse me, it will not be accepted for you. So remember, the worshipers would bring a a bull, or they'd bring a lamb, or they'd bring a goat, and they'd bring it to the tabernacle. Here's my question. 
If one of those was blemished and it was offered on the altar, who was responsible? It wasn't the worshiper. It came out of their hands. At that point, it was the priest's job. A major part of the priest's work was quality control. He had to make sure that during his shift, no unclean animals, no blemished animals, no cripples animals would be offered in the system. He couldn't let down his guard. He couldn't go to sleep on the job. He couldn't just go through the motions mindlessly. He had to be focused. And he had to give it his very best effort. He had to be diligent about the gifts that were given to him and mindful of their importance. So what do we do with this today? Well, modern church leaders, we don't butcher animals or eat offerings that way. But we are still serving God and serving God's people. And we should do it with excellence and diligence. Whether we are on the clock or we are off the clock, we are held to a higher standard of integrity. D.A. Carson has said, from God's perspective, leadership goes hand in hand with responsibility. The two are inseparable. And those who lead God's people must be responsible in their tasks, in their ministry, in their priorities, to do it in a way that is honoring to Him. Seminary students, listen to me closely. There is a huge difference between what you can do in ministry and what you must do in ministry. And very often the secret to success in ministry is being able to prioritize and distinguish the two. The early apostles were not immune to this temptation. Acts chapter 6. Did you hear the scripture reading earlier that Joe did? What happened? There was this soup kitchen and there was all these problems and everybody wasn't getting along and the priests, excuse me, the apostles were called into this and the apostles came and they looked at the situation and they looked at all this and what did they say in Acts chapter 6 verse 2? It is not good for us to neglect the Word of God for serving tables. Now, is it wrong to serve tables? Of course not. But it is wrong to serve tables if God has told you to study the Bible and to pray. There's a priority that has to be met and kept. You can do this, but the apostles said, no, 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 we must do this. We have a generation of pastors today who spend more time on the church's image than they do the church's message. That is the essential thing. That is the priority. And we are to be diligent in that. Do you remember James chapter 3, verse 1? Let not many of you become teachers. He's not talking about drama teachers or middle school teachers or art teachers. When he says teachers, he's talking about teachers in the church. He says, let not many of you become teachers. Why? Because we shall receive a stricter judgment. In other words, we're held to a higher standard in how we handle God's Word. I tell my preaching students that the scariest part of preaching is not standing before your congregation. It's knowing that one day you'll stand before the throne. Everybody loves to quote 2 Timothy 4.2 in the ministry because it says, quote, preach the word. But everybody seems to forget what comes in verse 1. Paul says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to come again to judge the living and the dead. Preach the word. If your job is to preach, don't forget it is Jesus' job to judge your preaching. And you will give an account for what you say and what you do, which is why you must be diligent and be careful with the gifts and the ministry that God has placed at your feet. This may seem like it's a long ways from Leviticus 22, but listen, this reminds me why every one of us needs to pray for our seminaries. Every one of us. Even if you don't go to seminary, even if you don't have anybody going there, because for the sake of your children and grandchildren... We need to pray for our seminaries. Because I won't be doing this forever. One day this will be passed off to somebody else. And the church and the seminaries have a vested interest in raising up men who will be diligent to fulfill their ministry, as Paul told Timothy. To not be lazy, to not slack off, to not neglect their responsibilities, but to do their work and to do it well down to the smallest 
of responsibilities. Of course, no earthly priest has done his job perfectly, and no earthly pastor has done his job perfectly, except for one priest and one pastor, and his name is Jesus. He lived the life we cannot live. He died the death that we deserve. In fact, just before he breathed his last breath, you remember what he said, those three words? It is finished. He fulfilled his ministry. He did it perfectly. And guess what? He didn't stop there because he rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven. And guess what? Right now, he is interceding for us perfectly at the right hand of the Father. And we are called as God's servants to follow in His footsteps, to follow in His example, and to know that we're held to a higher standard and to do it diligently. So whether God's called you to be in spiritual leadership, whether you're currently in spiritual leadership, or you're just under spiritual leadership, we all have a vested interest that those who would lead us are held to the standard that God has placed before them. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You. We thank You, Lord, for these chapters from Leviticus about Your holy leaders. And Lord, we ask and we pray in this room right now that You would do the work of conviction that only You can do. Father, for those who are currently serving in leadership, for our elders and our deacons and even Sunday school teachers and others, we pray, Father, that they will recommit themselves afresh and anew. Father, I confess my sins of coming up short of what you've called me to do. Father, I pray for your cleansing of my own heart, that you would renew within me a desire to serve and to serve well. Father, for those whose ambition and desire and goal is studying and pursuing ministry, may they right now commit themselves to be qualified and to live above and beyond those around them so that they can be good examples to the flock. And for all of us who are under spiritual leadership, may we pray for them. May we encourage them. May we thank them for their good example so that we might grow into the mature man into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for our great high priest, for the chief shepherd. May we look to him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.